that. So my name is Michael Hollinger. Um, I'm actually uh, one of the team leaders for uh, a product that's called Power AI Vision. Um, I've worked at IBM in a bunch of different roles over the last uh, 13 and a half years or so. Um, I've actually worked uh, out of Austin for most of that, but I've had a chance to work out of IBM Taiwan as well uh, for a couple of your assignments. My background is in high performance software and around optimization of software for hardware. So um, like I, we were talking about earlier, but I've done clock controlled software for like motherboards and systems and things like that. I got into Linux development a little while ago and then got deeper into that and now actually helped to run a team that's doing uh, application development around uh, AI offerings in the company. So today we're, we're going to talk about a few different things. Um, first, uh, I, I want to talk about uh, why we as a company are in this space and uh, really give a little bit of context. Uh, second, I want to explain um, this, this tool, this pipeline that we're going to talk about and get questions from you and we'll talk a little bit more with the whiteboard and uh, kind of chat about it more as developers. And then uh, three, kind of look at the capabilities of the application and how we actually leverage those um, as we go out to uh, build something that someone could actually go use in production. Uh, but you know, first, I actually have a little warm-up thing because it's been kind of a long day. So uh, I want to ask everybody, um, what's a bike look like? Wheels, OK. Two, I heard two. Handlebars. Frame. Frame. Brakes. Brakes. Seat. Seat, OK. Gears. Gears. Pedals. Pedals. Chain. Chain. Yeah. Tires, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, we're, we're talking about uh, features in, in, in the device, right? And you can kind of uh, think about what uh, a bike as an archetypical bike might actually look like, right? But, but if we take a look at real life, it's a little bit different sometimes. And um, one of the things that we, we actually see is that everyone kind of starts with, and they describe that bicycle um, actually in the upper left corner. And actually, I, I've done this a bunch of times. If you were to go sit and try to draw a bicycle without looking at one, um, probably about a quarter of the time, someone draws a bicycle that actually can't turn, because they, they try to connect the, the uh, frame the wrong way. But like a bicycle looks a certain way from a certain perspective, right? But you can see that from the front, uh, that's still the same bike as far as we know, but you can't tell that there's two wheels. Uh, bikes can also be upside down. Bikes can also be things like a piece of art that technically is a bicycle, but there's a bunch of other stuff kind of attached to it. And in fact, uh, this was a bicycle, and technically it still is by parts, but it's not really rideable as a bicycle, right? But you can also see this one that I actually kind of like, it's a tricycle, but from the side, it looks like a bicycle, right? So is that technically a bicycle or not? Um, finally, you have the special cases like a bike that will cover a child as well that has three wheels, but still it's a bicycle. And the literal bicycle that is two wheels and a person that has gears, it has brakes, it has a seat, it has all the things we just mentioned, but it does not look like that one, right? So all these things kind of fit in the realm of what's a bicycle for us. And this is the kind of thing that you end up with when you start talking about real world deployments of machine vision applications uh, in the wild. You have these kind of interesting problems that show up where things come out of left field and you have to kind of deal with that and build that into uh, the application, build it into the pipeline and build that into your ability to actually deploy that pipeline out. And we're going to talk about that. So over the last several years, um, we've made a lot of innovations in the industry, and we've actually seen that uh, machine vision uh, types of problems have greatly advanced in, in terms of what uh, capabilities are out there in the state of the art. So um, about, say, seven years ago, you got about three quarters of the time right if you were to ask a system, what is this picture? So there's different challenges out there. You can kind of see that you know, the error rate was about 25, 26%. We now got to the point where a deep learning based application can actually best a human being uh, given a certain set of images. And, and you're seeing that because we figured out that there's certain techniques and certain uh, challenges we've overcome uh, for applying and building out these massive data sets and, and figuring out how to actually architect the network in such a way that you can actually solve these problems in a way that's actually scalable and you can actually put out in production. So we've seen this kind of shift in the industry over time. For us, 
I want to talk a little bit about something that, that, that kind of addresses this, because this is a little bit important um, in the context of, of IBM, because a lot of people hear about IBM and they hear about um, the IBM cloud offerings, the IBM Watson branding and things like that. Um, I actually work on a thing that's called Power AI. And, and this is actually all kind of underneath all that, right? We, we're, we're not going to be something that's going to necessarily be an API endpoint out on the cloud somewhere. What we're actually talking about is a software stack that's a software stack that's tuned for hardware. And we tune it at all levels here. Um, that's, that's part of the, the genesis of my group, Cognitive Systems. This is actually what we as a group call our entire organization. And that, that's intentionally a little bit vague because we build the microprocessor, we build the processor, uh, the backplane, we build the system, we design the systems, we build the firmware for it, and we build the OS uh, patches that are necessary for it on Linux, all the driver stuff that's, that's built by teams that sit like back here, sit across the street, and sit across the world. But we operate at all levels of the stack. And Power AI is something that actually pushes that optimization uh, up into the layers of the stack necessary to apply machine learning or deep learning based um, uh, algorithms toward problems. And, and this is something that's important because uh, these are the kind of foundational things that a lot of people talk about as like the, the super low level of, of their applications, but really there's much, much, much more beneath that. And what we're doing with this is we're actually building, for example, um, distributions of uh, TensorFlow, uh, PyTorch, Theano Cafe, uh, uh, like all the different things that you'd want into um, what we're calling a Power AI distribution. So you go get a binary, get a container, spin it up, don't have to worry about compiling stuff or sorting out the configuration stuff. It just kind of works. Um, that's the value prop we bring to it from a developer's perspective. The cool thing is because it's optimized for hardware, it actually scales really well. So we have a lot of cool things that show that we're really fast at, at doing certain things. We, we built the computer for that. So if you've heard of something called NVLink, NVLink is, for example, how NVIDIA couples their GPUs together. We actually have NVLink to our processor, which other people don't have. So we have extremely high bandwidth to and from the GPUs, so we can do things much more efficiently, much faster uh, using these systems. And we, we want to bring that out and make that easy to use. That's why PowerEye exists. In, in the computer vision space, uh, computer vision as a whole is actually a growing market. So we actually see that, that right now, um, uh, it's, it's about a $2 billion, $2.5 billion market, but year-over-year year growth is going to see that it's actually going to be something that will be uh, $11 billion over like 2022. And that's because there's this kind of in, inflection point that's happened where we figured out again as an industry how to start applying this optimization, start applying this hardware to these interesting problems. We were talking about it actually before the meetup that you know, I, I can actually take a video feed and, given the right stuff, start telling about interactions between a customer and an employee in a retail space. And I can start t measuring things about that and start telling about how efficient is this uh, individual, how efficient is this particular store, and doing things to help course correct or help to improve that experience for the customer. So going back to my, my kind of AI stack for a sec, um, we actually, again, play at all levels of this. And, and the part that I work on is something we call Power AI Vision. Uh, Power AI Vision is an application that's optimizing that machine vision uh, pipeline, which we'll talk about in a second, leveraging all the levels of optimization underneath it to, to help build a really easy to use, but still highly efficient um, piece of software and uh, software hardware combination. So this is something that, that is part of a broader play that we have. But again, it, it's, it's not just like a Watson thing or not just uh, a cafe thing. This is actually kind of optimizing everything from the uh, source this or, or activate at the level of like Python all the way down to the microprocessor itself and the buses in and out of the microprocessor. So we play at all levels of this and we optimize all levels of this. So we're in this space, and this is where we're going to start talking about the machine vision stuff. Because if you consider machine vision problems generally as a broad set, there's kind of a, a common set of problems that you have to overcome. And, and there's different players involved in that as well. So if we talk about bringing out a machine vision application, it, it, it's not just uh, getting a data scientist to go out and build a model. 
First, I have to get a data set. I have to somehow curate the data set. I have to make sure it's valid and make sure it's good. I then have to get someone to go and train a model for that. I have to verify that model, and I have to hope that I got it right, go back and check that I actually did get it right, and keep iterating until I get to the point of being satisfied in however I define that, right? At some point, I actually choose to deploy that model, and that deployment is probably going to be at a different person that actually knows how DevOps might work, and they actually know how uh, QoS might work, or uh, quality of service or, or uh, service level agreements might work for other parts of a business or other clients that you might have. And finally, there's actually the actual end user who's trying to go and leverage whatever it is all these other people built. Each one of those people has a different set of capabilities and different set of needs, but they all have to work together and they all have to do similar things to go and solve the overall problem. Traditionally, when we talk about machine vision software, machine vision applications, we kind of focus on the developer. and We focus on enabling and building a really great piece of software for that developer. But that's not the whole thing, and that's not going to solve the broader set of issues that come up here. Uh, so what we actually do is we focus in a little bit on that kind of data engineer. We focus on the subject matter experts, and we focus on that data scientist and look at what are their needs and what are the things that you have to do in this space to help build out and deploy out that model in a way that I can use it. So this is that pipeline we're going to start talking about for the next part of this, the meetup. So for us, um, when we look at this, we actually consider uh, uh, the machine vision pipeline as something that is uh, kind of a standard set of tools. So for us, we actually built an application that's available through a web browser, which I'll show you all in a few minutes. But it's all point and click, and it's all something that's designed in a way that you can label your data, train your model, and deploy your model in such a way that you're really never required to write code unless you want to. And to be honest, you don't have to know about the internals of it, but you can if you want to dive in. So for us, we, we look at and consider a couple of different capabilities. So uh, we'll talk about these, and I'd be happy to t take questions about this as well. But we actually do um, uh, the same basic workflow for classification of images and for object detection. So when I talk about classification uh, versus object detection, uh, do, do you all know the differences and kind of what the capability of one is versus the other? Um, when I say classification, that's actually saying uh, given an image, given a JPEG, is this a picture of a puppy? Given a JPEG, is this a picture of a kitten? It's not find the kittens or find the puppies, but rather just what is this image? So classification typically problems are going to be uh, the, the classical hot dog or not hot dog from Silicon Valley, <laughs> which I have built like a dozen different times, a dozen different ways. Uh, by the way, uh, MS Coco, uh, the MS Coco data set, uh, has uh, at least 2,000 labeled hot dogs in its uh, uh, data set. <laughs> and uh, it's just entertaining to have to explain that's why that's on my test system every now and then. <laughs> but uh, classification is really asking the question, what is this image? Like, what, what, is, what is this a picture of? And it's not trying to do localization or not trying to explain what's in it, but just overall, what is the image? Uh, you typically see things like heat maps when you talk about this, because it's very easy to, to visualize the, uh, the output of the network. The heat map actually that we show here is the, uh, I think, the lowest level activation layers of the network. So it's kind of the final, the final bits that are saying, yeah, this is a house with a pool or a house without a pool, and showing like what, what pixels basically are causing us to think that's why that is. Um, a different thing is object detection. And uh, object detection is answering a different question, which is, show me where this is in the image. There's a totally different technique for this. And it's solving a different problem, which is really object localization within the images, right? So the examples here we actually show are kind of a safety thing. So like, you know, show me where the vests are. Show me the helmets in the picture. That's actually, for us, a technique that we actually use called uh, faster RCNN. So if you're familiar with that, we actually uh, we, we follow that and we, we have an implementation of that inside the tool. But we use object detection to try to solve problems where people want to go and localize something in a picture. So if I took a picture of, say, this water bottle, I could find all the water bottles uh, in, the, in, the, in the room or in the image, that kind of thing. 
One of the things that's important for us is that by considering this as kind of a pipeline, right, as, as a workflow for users, um, we find that there's this kind of iteration that occurs. So if you've ever played with um, uh, TensorFlow or played with uh, really any of the frameworks, right, and you've done one of the machine vision kinds of exercises, um, you find that you're going to mess with the data set, train a model, look at how it did, fiddle with it, go back, mess with the data set, and you keep kind of ping-ponging back and forth until you get to the point of being happy with it. So recognizing this is kind of a common flow, we actually built in the idea of, of using uh, the model to actually label the data and validate that labeling and things like that, which I'll show you all in a bit. But this is something where we want to be able to switch users from generating labeled data to being more of an auditor of the system and just kind of overseeing the labeled data. Because it's just faster. If, if I have to go through and draw 200 boxes, it's going to take a while. If I can just fix up a few boxes, that's going to be way better for me. So let's actually take a look at it, because um, I think we can actually have a little bit of fun and uh, talk a little bit more. So um, I actually have a copy of this running on one of our boxes across the street. And uh, what we're doing is we're looking at uh, a system that's actually running on bare metal uh, Kubernetes. It's running on top of a Kubernetes. Oh, I logged out. <laughs> Man, I got logged out from the tab. That's fine. So this is actually a box that's running Kubernetes on um, uh, my system across the street. It's running bare metal. Uh, it's not in any cloud anywhere, but it runs inside of a machine called IBM Cloud Private. So I can run Kubernetes on whatever hardware you give me, basically. I can scale out and kind of do whatever. Um, uh, this is where we get into the kind of uh, interesting developer focus, the kind of nerd focus, which is what I like. So we, we built the entire application uh, on top of Kubernetes, and it basically sits inside of a Helm chart. Everything is containerized. Everything is a pod. So when I talk about the services that enable us to do the things that I just told you about, they're all running as containers inside this pipeline. And we built that that way on purpose because we want to be able to enable users to uh, get value from the application as a whole overall application. Uh, a image analyst from an insurance company is not going to know what any of these words mean, but if you're developing and, and building an app out on top of it, we'll provide you like a container that you can go use to go do stuff in, or we'll expose a REST API to you, or things like that. So when I look at this inside my browser, I'm actually looking at um, a instance of the application running inside of Kubernetes. And for us, that workflow that I kind of explained to you we, we kind of see it, in, in, again, in these broad terms of really building a data set, prepping your data, training your model, and then deploying your model. Those are kind of the broad tasks that we kind of see people trying to do. So for us, when I look at my data sets, I can see a bunch of different things. And, and we have different examples that we kind of go through here. But I'll show you the US Grand Prix. So um, if I go to YouTube and hit play real quick, this is actually a video from the US Grand Prix that uh, Formula One put out um, after the race last year. It's their highlight video. It's six minutes. Someone put it together after the race to tell a story about, um, let's see, who's, this one's Lewis Hamilton, um, Max Verstappen, and who's the Ferrari guy? Thank you, thank you, uh, Sebastian Bettel. So it's those three kind of duking it out for first place. That's, that's the narrative of this video. And so they, they put the video together kind of highlighting the race. It's, it's about a 90 minute, two hour race, but they called it down to two, six minutes. Um, this video is actually uh, a video that I pulled into the tool. So if I go into label objects on this, and I unzoom me so I can see more of the screen, um, I have the same video inside the program. And uh, we can watch the same video here. Uh, when I, again, I talk about building out uh, data sets, right? Uh, one of the things that's important for us in, in machine vision applications especially is that we work with both images and video. And we actually combine those together into the same data sets. So I could easily drag a JPEG onto this and pop it in and have a JPEG image aside from the video frames I can pull out. You can see here that I spent a good like 20 minutes on this one frame, which was a really big pain in the butt. But uh, I labeled every single car uh, according to the starting grid. And what I did is I labeled them according to their teams. Because if you don't know Formula One, um, the cars are 
10 teams, two cars each. Each car is nearly identical, save for the number, and a little tiny black or neon yellow thing at the top. That's pretty much it. So even with like super high def video, as a human being, I can't tell them apart. So I'm not going to try to have the machine tell it apart either. But I can go by team pretty easily. So I label all the teams, and I went through, and I, I, I drew little boxes on stuff. And the way that works for us is if I go in and I can, like, say, capture a frame, that's going to go out and do a capture of that. And if I go over to a minute and 13 seconds, and I get it exactly right, whichever one I picked, that one, I can go in and I can just simply say, which one do you think that is? That, is that Mercedes? Yeah, it's probably Mercedes. This is how we introduce bias into models, by the way. <laughs> 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 which which I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm totally going to get to in this talk. Uh, but um, so that's, that's kind of it, right? So, so that label, that's labeling um, in, inside the application. So as a user, I just drag and drop on top of it. Go for it. So my question, I think I know the answer, but just mm -hmm. to verify. You're, you're saying uh, you gave the computer or your program the go train up yourself and then it's a fresh image to identify this car. You're not taking the delta of all the images to this point and saying, based on physics, it's got to be this car, right? Correct. Yeah, I'm going to get to that, actually. But you're right. We, don't, we actually don't have a concept of time in, in our building our data sets or labeling our data. Um, everything we have here that you see is uh, treating uh, each image as a discrete frame, and each discrete frame is a discrete image. So there's no sense of continuity from one to the other. Um, great. And it's, it's actually a really interesting problem that comes up because as, as humans, we actually kind of intuitively know, given a video, that this thing here, a quarter second later, even if it's over here, is roughly the same thing. So there's actually work that one of my colleagues is doing around the idea of trying to, to build a network that it kind of has that understanding, but we're like working on it, and it's not, it's not here. Uh, but for, for this purpose, right, uh, we actually consider a video basically as a container of JPEGs. Like, it's, it's just that's how we see it. And that's actually how we wrote the code, to be honest. Um, but as we go and capture stuff, I can go and label things. And you can kind of see that I went and uh, drew boxes on, on these frames. So I sat for probably like two hours over the course of uh, an afternoon and just, just sat here kind of picking stuff and drawing on, on about 200 frames-ish out of a... 12,000 frame video, just to give you a sense of, of kind of the percentage of, of the video that I labeled. Um, I actually trained a model on that. So if I go in and I, I go into uh, my data set again, if I choose to train the model, um, again, you know, we, we kind of try to make this something that's, that's accessible to people who don't have a data science background. But they can still kind of know what, they, what their goal is. Um, this is progressing you down that pipeline now. So presuming I've gone and labeled my video, and I've labeled my images, I, I now need to train a model in the application. So for us, I can kind of guide you down that path and say, OK, well, what do you want to do with your data set? Do you want to do classification? Do you want to do object detection? Those, those two things. You tell me that, and I'll give you some more options. So I combine these together because in our labeling of the data sets, if I go back to that, you'll notice that in my USGP Golden, this actually is uncategorized technically, because it's, it's a video and it's all the same stuff basically. But if I were to go into a uh, example that's like a medical example, uh, we've actually gone and we've done work to uh, set up the, the application so that I can go and do both labeling of specific things on an image as well as categorization of the overall image like I told you earlier. So I can use the same tooling to configure the data set for both use cases. So I go into my. Can oh, go for it. Can you use like existing knowledge to kind of uh, train whatever this like uh, like example that you just gave as like uh, you know like how do you recognize a cancer? Cancer, you know, based on the information that you know mm -hmm. as an ex, uh, SME, should be able to kind of uh, you know train it that way instead of manually kind of like entering information training. Right, so that's one of the things that, that we, we've actually talked about on our team, and one of, one of our developers is standing right next to you, and he and I have talked about this idea of annotating. <laughs> Sorry, Carl. Uh, but uh, we've talked about uh, how we build the uh, annotation pipeline into the system as well. So um, but you'll notice that in, in all, all of our stuff here, um, 
I don't talk about file names. I don't talk about uh, the contents, or I don't talk about the camera, or um, when the image was taken, stuff like that. We actually can track that. We just don't expose it through the UI. But there's extra data that comes from medical. That's, it's just different file formats and things like that. But, but yeah, we, we've actually got an idea for how to do that in such a way that you can actually annotate the, the images as they're arriving in the system, so you're not having to sit there and click on stuff and say, yeah, this is yeah. normal or not. That, that would be too manual. Right. So, so it's, it's, it's a thing that, that we're actually aware of, and this thing that programmatically I can do, but I can't expose through the front end of the application. So is it applicable to, to the, uh, the example that you gave in the reading also? In the, in the F? Yeah, actually, a, a, per a perfect example is actually, um, I was actually thinking about this as I was doing, the, as I was doing this. Um, I've been out to uh, Coda, I've been out to the track, and if you've ever walked the track, it's, it's got some pretty distinctive visuals from certain points. So um, there's a turn complex that's the turn 12 corners that look a certain way, right? They, they just have, it, it's always filmed from the same perspective, and they always look the same way. Um, I know that's what that looks like, so I know that's what that is. But given the fact that if I were to get the raw camera feed from uh, Formula One or from the track officiants, I could actually just tell it's camera number seven, and I can load that into the system and know camera number seven is at turn 12. So therefore, all my video from this is from turn 12, and that becomes one of my categories. We just don't, I don't have that data because I pulled it off YouTube. But that, that's, that's totally a thing that, that we're, we're aware of and we're designing for, we just don't have in the, in the product. That's the exact kind of use case that's an interesting combination of, of both the visual and non-visual data that we understand about the system. Another example, actually, is um, if I have cameras that are attached to moving vehicles, uh, I have not just the camera data, but I have telemetry about where the vehicle is. I know the vehicle ID. I might even know the driver of the vehicle. Um, I might know um, what city or what its path is or where it's supposed to be and stuff like that. And all those things can actually be extra data points you can use to help either build your data set or help with other parts of solving your problems. And, and Mike, mm -hmm. so in, in the example of the medical industry, yep. they're already pre-labeled good, bad, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. Cancer, not cancer. The, 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 tool, the tool does allow you to load up yes. all the good images and in one step label yep. them all good and then all the bad ones. Yep. So you don't necessarily have to go through each individual image. Right. Like yeah, actually, I can, I can easily go in here and I can actually say, uh, for example, if I go into these, and I don't know what I'm doing, right, But because uh, I am not trained in this, but I can assign all these two categories and I can say it is one of these several issues, and it becomes a thing that becomes a, a workflow optimization as to how do you scale that. We have APIs for everything we talk about here. So everything that's in the application um, front end that's actually visible on the screen is actually a uh, React, um, uh, React Redux uh, front end um, built running in the browser. Uh, so everything that you see, every API, is exposed um, from our back end. So everything you can do from the browser, you can do as a developer. So if you want to ingest data in the system, we have a thing for that. If you want to label data, we have a thing for that. If you want to kick off training, we have a thing for that. Um, if you want to make inferences, we have a thing for that too. So the whole idea here is that we're not going to hide anything from you. We're not going to try to obfuscate it. We're not going to try to authenticate it. We want you to be able to use it easily as, a, as an end user. But if you want to go build something that's bespoke engineered, you can go do that. And people are doing that kind of thing. So for me, when I go to train a model, I can choose which way I want to go. And if I choose object detection, notice that some stuff kind of changed on the screen here, right? I can actually choose what type of model I want to train. This is where we start going into more of that data science view of the world. And, and this is where we start exposing a little bit of, about the internals of the system uh, to the user. If you were to just click object detection and hit go, you'd never know what YOLO or faster RCNN are, and you shouldn't need to care. But if you happen to know what those two things are, we can tell you straight up, these are the two models we have to choose from. You may choose one or the other. You may tune some hyperparameters, and you can hit go and let it train. I'm actually going to do that just for the sake of showing you all what it looks like. But for us, what's happening now is I'm actually spinning up a Kubernetes uh, deployment of a pod that's actually going to go and train my model for whatever I just set as the defaults, which is 4,000 iterations. Uh, under the covers, I'll actually show you if I do a get pods on it. You'll see this training pod that came up 16 seconds ago. And if I go look at it, um, it spins up. And if you've ever used faster RCNN and CAFE, if anyone's ever messed with that, this might look familiar to you. That's what this is. 
Um, we actually build on top of a lot of open source inside of the product. There's some stuff that's a little bit different here. You'll notice there's some extra messages about like uh, app messages and some smoothing and some extra statistics that we actually pull out. These are because we actually instrument the application so that we can expose it to the front end. So as a user, um, if you've played with these kinds of things uh, from notebooks or if you've done work for this in, in your own um, uh, specific applications or your own specific jobs or, or just for fun, you're probably familiar with this view of the world. But the better thing is actually just look at charts and see what's happening, right? So we're actually instrumenting the output of the system, exposing it through the front end and kind of showing you what's happening as the training progresses. And again, the idea here is we want to make it such that a, a end user who's not necessarily trained in deep learning is able to understand, hey, it's, it's doing the right thing. Or it looks a little wonky. Um, let's go find a data scientist and actually go look at what happened. Uh, so one of our testers actually uh, was playing with this and was just doing like the normal stuff you do to test software. And he picked a bunch of odd values and managed to make um, uh, one of our test data sets totally diverge. Like the loss just went up here and stood up here. And it's the kind of thing that I can look at that and know that's not the right behavior. Uh, but there's more subtle things that might happen where like it may never quite converge or it might actually converge too quickly and end up be overfitting or stuff like that. And you can kind of start to see those things. In fact, we're actually going to enhance this for a new version to add way more stats like uh, adding confusion matrices or um, other things to the tool so you can actually really see what's happening in, under the covers. Well, so hardware resources are represented by one pod. Uh, that's a great question. So we actually have an interesting kind of love-hate thing with Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, if you've ever played with Kubernetes with GPUs, uh, the GPU plugins in Kubernetes are the Wild West, and they seem to change from every dot version to every dot version. So right now, GPU allocations in Kubernetes are on a whole discrete GPU basis. So when I go to allocate something uh, for a pod, uh, I have to give it a, a minimum of one GPU. And I have to give it any amount of RAM and CPU that I want, right? But that whole GPU gets given to that pod. So we make a simplification here to say, this training job is using the whole GPU. So this is a whole um, Tesla P100, I think. Or actually, let's see, is this P or V? It's going up beyond like, what the whole GPU becomes. Yeah, well, we actually we can do that as well. Um, we're, we're actually talking about that for our roadmap of, of how we introduce that to the users. But uh, yeah, you can start doing things where you start scaling GPUs. The interesting problem is actually not uh, scaling out to multiple GPUs. It's actually the usage of GPU memory for a given job, right? So like right now, size yep. So take a look at, for example, the output here, right? Yeah. So my training job is actually only consuming about three and a half gig or so, right? So I'm leaving memory on the table. This is because based on stuff, this is what works, and this is efficient for us, and it doesn't break anything across the different platforms. But if you were to write something custom, you're leaving room on the table here. What we're actually going to do is we're actually working on how do you try to compact these together so they sit on the same GPU in a way that I can start running multiple things together and actually start understanding that. The biggest thing is that that's where Kubernetes is going. Like that's totally, like that resource allocation problem is totally a solved problem in every other space except for these. So it's going to happen. So we're now kind of just waiting to see when G like device plugins are going to catch up and stuff. But we're, we're going to have to solve it at some point. Um, so as this goes, it's going to keep training. It's going to do what it's going to do. The final result, um, I can I'm just going to, you know, I'll let it go. We'll let it roll, rock and roll. Uh, the final result ends up looking something like this. So if I look at this, um, I, this one I did, this is actually what um, we're going to talk about more in a few minutes, but this model trained um, over the course of about 40 minutes, give or take, on my system. Um, so it took 8,000 iterations, about 40 minutes. It's using CAFE under the covers, which no one asked me, so it's CAFE. Uh, but uh, this is actually running all on my system across the street. So it's a, that's a, what did we figure it out? This is a bunch of P100s. So I'm running P100s uh, connected via NVLink to the main CPU. So I've got that kind of high bandwidth link uh, to the GPUs. And if you haven't seen one of these, um, the pedestal that's out there, uh, that kind of big obelisk looking thing, it's a touch screen. You can tap on it, and you can kind of get an interior view of all the machines. So you can see what the guts of this looks like. And it's got these, uh, if you've not seen what an XXM2 GPU looks like, 
It's this funky dual socket thing. It's not a PCI card. So it's got these two pin connectors, and it's this giant heat sink and chip combo that kind of sits down. So we actually have up to six of these on the back plane on the system and two CPU sockets next to them. So the machine that we're talking about is built kind of balanced for these deep learning kind of workloads. And that's, that's why the software stack is, exists, because we want to try to you know, make it easy to utilize it. So if I want to go off and, and try to see how this works, uh, I can go in and I can take my model. I can deploy the model. So if I go in and pick that, um, I've actually already deployed it. But uh, when I hit deploy, that pops up inside my workflow. So I keep moving through my workflow. This uh, model is, again, another Kubernetes pod. And this pod is running uh, now uh, a copy of Cafe, just like the other Cafe. But it's wrapped around, um, it's wrapped in a web service. The web service accepts uh, certain posts and gets. And I can tell its status and stuff like that. But fundamentally, I can give it a stimulus and get a response back. So if I go to my system and I drop frame number 180 on it, I can see the result that comes out. These are all the inferences that come out. And, and we actually expose um, what that looks like. So if I go into developer mode and do it for my other frame, you all can see that as well. So if I look at our response, uh, the JSON is not very pretty, but uh, <laughs> let's just do this. There we go, much better. Um, that's even much better. So we get back a bunch of information about the image. And it, for, for a user, what I can tell here is, here is the image that, that we actually processed. There's the MD5 of it in case we're checking stuff. But I get a confidence, I get some bounding boxes, and I get a label. So we start talking about this not at the level of cafe and inferences, but at a post and JSON kind of response. So it starts becoming more friendly to uh, a plain, uh, not plain, but a developer like me that doesn't necessarily know about the guts of the systems. So that's what we expose out to the front end of our applications, which you kind of get as a developer who's doing inferences in the system as well. So those inferences end up uh, being rendered into something that looks like this, where I can start seeing little boxes. But the interesting thing is I can actually take that, and um, I've, I, I tinker with Python, right? So I'm not very good at it. But um, I, I tinker with Python, and I can use this to take all my frames from my video, explode it into 12,000 frames, like I told you. So if I look at um, the USGP directory in my system, you will see all of these. And I learned that uh, Mac OS and BSD have a thing where if you do RM star, it actually does a weird thing when there's more than, say, like 9,999 files. It actually won't do it. It says there's too many, like, star expands, and there's an odd bug. So uh, I learned about some odd behaviors in Mac OS this way. But uh, what we're looking at is actually something we call um, uh, a code pattern. Um, we actually post these um, out, and you can see the notebook, and it'll be in the link when we get done with this. But um, this notebook is one of our example notebooks that we put out to show how to use uh, the APIs and show how to use the tool. The example we use is counting um, you know, from a traffic camera. So I took it to F1 and kind of ran with it a little bit. But the idea here is that you can understand how to pick up and use the APIs from start to finish. And you can see all the code, see all the examples, see all the the stuff that you have to kind of do that's uh, not necessarily important to your problem, but important to solving the overall um, use case. So for example, my frame parsing exploding code is this frame parsing exploding code. Um, when I get back a single inference, it looks kind of like that, just like I showed you. And when we look at the results here, um, I can go and ask the system on a per frame basis, tell me what you got. Like, tell me what, what came back. So um, I actually wrote this in a way that as a user, when I go and do my inferences, uh, I save them out to some JSON file on my local disk. Because uh, again, I don't, once I make the inference, I kind of get it and I need it and it's done. I don't want to have to go and rerun that every single time. So I save it to JSON and I can load it back later. 
So I can then play with the rest of the switches, all the pretty stuff about rendering the videos and making little boxes or dots or whatever to make that look nice. Uh, one of the things that I'm going to show you is actually how to take AI Vision's output, all that object tracking stuff, and actually apply that to, to uh, solving an actual real problem. So for us, uh, because, I, again, I kind of like the Grand Prix because it's coming up in a couple of weeks, I was actually looking at it and was asking, so, like, how much screen time did Mercedes get relative to Ferrari? Because uh, like those are the two, like that's again, that's a story I told you, right? It's, it was Mercedes, Red Bull, and Ferrari duking it out for first place, right? So um, I actually labeled and used that model we were looking at. Um, I actually ran um, uh, through all the video, and the re result is something that looks like this. So when I hit play on it, this is pre-rendered because I wanted to make it look nice to, for you, but what you're looking at is you're actually looking at uh, the system's output tracking the cars by team. So the teal dots are Mercedes, the red dots are Ferrari, the, the blue dots are uh, F1, oops, F1, are uh, Red Bull. The pink is uh, Force India, uh, Sauber, um, uh, Renault, uh, Toro Rosso, Williams. So I think I hit all 10, oh, McLaren. So there's 10 different teams, 10 different colors. So as you watch it drive around, you'll actually see it uh, try to label and figure out uh, who's who um, and uh, kind of label that. Uh, in the right side, what you're looking at is you're actually seeing uh, the sum of screen time by team, the sum of screen time by advertiser. So I also labeled all the advertisers that are on screen. So if you stop right here, Rolex bought linear miles of advertising at the track. If you've not been, or you didn't go last year, they had just the Rolex logo around corners on like vertical surfaces everywhere, right? So Rolex is kind of the number one advertiser if you just go look at stuff and just glance at it. But there's also advertising in here, another Rolex. There's also advertising in here from a few different other uh, vendors. Uh, Pirelli shows up, uh, Heineken shows up, uh, Emirates shows up, uh, Susan G. Komen and DHL um, also show up as well. So you can kind of see in the background here, um, you'll notice the little flickering dots as stuff goes by. One of my favorite things that happened is that I did not label people, okay? I did not draw boxes on people, but that's actually correct. So as near as I can tell, what happened here is that um, there's top-down shots of the cars so like there, there's a camera like up above where the driver's sitting, and it's looking down because it's kind of a cockpit view. So it catches the corner of the helmet, and I think that was a little bit of enough that between that and kind of the close-up shots of the side of the car, that it sort of figured out that's what the logos in the uniform helmet look like. To be honest, I haven't, I've, I haven't really gone and verified that, but I was kind of surprised that it that honestly did that. Yeah, it's, it's just interesting that happens. Uh, so as you, oh, there, so Komen went by and there's Johnny Walker as well, right? So we start to answer questions that are more interesting, nuanced questions, which is, you know, not just, you know, who was on screen at a given time, but, you know, how often was uh, Emirates on screen with Red Bull, right? So how many Red Bull fans uh, are going to see an Emirates ad in the background? Or how many Ferrari fans are going to see an Emirates ad in the background? Those are the kinds of interesting questions that you can start kind of going back and trying to answer. And it, an even more um, nuanced one is, if you are going to buy advertising at the track, where should you spend your money, right? If you have access to all these videos from the last five or six years, you can go back and through and look at it. And you can tell based on this highlight video where things are, what stuff is going to be in shot. So you can actually start trying to figure out the relative cost or relative value to you as an advertiser for that space, right? And these are questions that you couldn't really answer without staring at a lot of stuff a couple of years ago. But, but I can start doing that for you now. We can start doing that now as an industry with like me training a model in an afternoon and then spending a day and a half figuring out how to draw smooth dots on the screen. Actually, I spent more time trying to solve the double dot problem than I did solving the object tracking problem. You'll actually see, uh, like, right there. Uh, so this is wrong. The Mercedes obviously is wrong. But like this getting the two Mercedes cars on the same car, 
That's a bug I have, and I just haven't figured out how to fix it yet. But uh, what's happening, actually, what's happening there is that we're getting the inference result back from the system. We're assigning an object tracker to it. So I actually put, I give it a bounding, I get a bounding box back. So I assign a bounding box to a tracker and tell uh, OpenCV in this case, tell me what's here and just tell me where it goes over time. And object tracking, if you've not played with it, is something that, that sometimes can lose its lock, like from frame to frame, but it, it won't lose totally what's going on. Uh, so the way I wrote this is um, every frame I go and do a tick through what all inferences do I get, what all object trackers do I have, where is there an inference inside an object tracker, delete all those, and then here's the new stuff that I get that's resulting. I have a bug in that that I have yet to figure out. Uh, that is resulting in us sometimes losing tracking for one frame, deciding that we lost what's there, discovering it again, and then finding it a frame later. But that, that's why there's the double counts that are up there. The actual object uh, tracking raw results that come back are actually a little bit more noisy because each frame, like I told you, uh, I think someone asked, you know, is it uh, a time series thing or is it just frame by frame? Each frame is discrete. So if you've ever played with this kind of stuff, when you do an inference for an image, you're going to get a bounding box that's going to be about the same, but it's going to be a little bit different each time. Like it may be just scooched a little bit, or it might be a little bit over, a little bit up, a little up, a little down. It'll still label the same car, but that's, that noise is actually visible in those. I'm smoothing that out here because I'm assigning these object trackers to it, but that's, that's just kind of how stuff works right now for us. Again, an interesting thing that comes out of this is that I can kind of see as we're going there's Pirelli in the background, right? So as we, we kind of look at this, you can start looking at and kind of seeing that Pirelli is uh, kind of off in, in the distance here, and Rolex is front and center. But notice the amount of screen time they're getting. They're, they're actually both kind of getting up there as this goes. And as we let this proceed, if I actually skip in and kind of look a little further, um, I'm actually going to go toward the end here. Uh, you'll see again that. Uh, over time, the advertising kind of matches up with what you would intuitively kind of guess just based on looking at the track. Rolex is up there. But to be honest, if I were to ask you to just tell me what all advertisers you saw on the screen, I bet you you wouldn't have been able to tell me that Pirelli and DHL were also there. But I can tell you absolutely Pirelli was on screen for 43 seconds in this video out of a six minute video, right? So you were exposed to Pirelli for 43 seconds. Uh, interestingly, um, I think, uh, this is where we talk about bias for a minute. You'll notice the screen time for the teams here. So we talk about, um, oh yeah, DHL. See a little dot? See it actually tracking in the corner? So we actually, we caught, again, I didn't label that, but uh, we caught that. So I think whoever edited the video, because it's, again, edited by a human being, uh, they actually edited the video to match up with the results of the race. So you can see Mercedes, Ferrari, Red Bull. That's actually the, the amount of screen time given by team, right? And it's an interesting thing. I don't, I don't know if they intended to do that or not, but that's the result of what actually happened here. So building this kind of thing is kind of an interesting exercise. So we actually have all the code for this kind of stuff out on GitHub. So if you go out to um, the, the link that we'll, I'm sure we'll share out later, uh, you can go grab the notebook, you can play with it, and you can apply it toward whatever use case you have and get the same kind of tracking, get the same kind of result out of the system. Uh, again, the idea is we want to try to make it easy to leverage the tool to go off and move through that pipeline. An interesting bit of bias here that actually comes in here. Um, if you look at our data set, if I go back into AI Vision, uh, I can actually go back and look at my data set and I can see in my data set what all I labeled. So I can go in and take a look at these, and I can click through. And again, this is something that was narrated, uh, kind of a, a, a narrative written by a person <coughs> who was telling a story in a six-minute video. So again, they're telling a story about Ferrari, Red Bull, Mercedes. And in this story, you can see they have this, this kind of top view of the, the Red Bull car, the back of the Mercedes car. I know what this looks like. I watched the video. I heard the narrative. So I labeled that as a Mercedes car. But if you watch my model, watch my video, and watch the result, you'll notice it actually has Mercedes here. But it tends to think every car shot from the rear view is a Mercedes, <laughs> right? 
Like it's an interesting little bit of a problem. It also has issues, um, uh, again, kind of looking at this a little closer, right? Like it, you can kind of see the Mercedes thing pop up a lot. It also tends to think that really shiny cars, uh, when the sun is hitting from a certain angle, is always a Mercedes because it's a silver car. But the Williams team is also a white car, and it's also shiny, so same angle, same problem. So you can see there's this kind of built-in built -in issue here. So I've got I to solve that. I've got to work on that. So I know I've got to work on my data set. So again, one of our value props for the tool is I can go in and say, all right, we can do better. Um, I actually pulled out and uh, yanked out, um, if I go back into my, uh, how about you? I can say, I want to go into one of these videos. I can choose to auto label that. And we'll do it over like every, say, 10 seconds of the same model. And what's happening is we're actually using the same um, inference endpoint, the same container, but we're capturing every 10 seconds or whatever I picked. And we're actually going to go and uh, ask the model, hey, what's here? and start capturing that and building that and adding that to my data set. So again, this is, again, that idea of building the workflow, building the pipeline out for that image analyst. And, and this is something that um, again, well, you can kind of do, you can script, you can kind of build out. But for us, we want to try to make it something where you can do it easily within the tool. So you can see these blue dots that are, that are here. These are actually are blue boxes that are here. Those are drawn by a human being. A teal box is drawn by the system, as far as we're concerned. So I got no clue if that's Mercedes or not. Don't know. I'm going to delete that from my data set because it's not going to help me. But uh, I can go in and take a closer look at this. And I can actually see this model. One, we don't have uh, Chenier uh, ads. So we need to add that to our data set. So it's really easy for me to add Chenier. And I can just go draw some boxes on that real quick. Can you all see where? Thank you. So I can go in and I can just draw boxes on that real quick if I wanted to, right? But at the same time, I can go down and take a look at the cars and say, yeah, that's probably not a Williams car. I bet that is a, um, I'm going to say, that's somebody else. That's Haas down there, I think, definitely, right? So we can start turning into more of an auditor of the system, and we can kind of say, OK, well, here's what we think is going on in the systems. So if I go through and start labeling my data set, I can, again, start auditing and building out a better data set for the system. So it actually caught the Rolex ads, which is great. Um, and I can, again, kind of see what's happening. And I can start building a better model, train the model again, and get a higher quality output. Uh, interesting thing here is generalization of models as well, right? So. Um, this is, again, all race data from a single uh, day. So what happens if I want to take that and say I want to put that out uh, for um, you know, the qualifying for the previous day or something like that? Um, I actually ran the same auto-labeling on uh, uh, this other video. It's a totally different video. Um, went through, and you can kind of see, uh, since we've never seen these frames before, it's a totally different day. It's still got Red Bull. It's still got other stuff. Uh, as I said, you know, we can kind of start saying, you know, what is this? Like, what do you all think that one was? <laughs> I think it's Mercedes because they have silver cars. <laughs> but uh, should we actually label that as Mercedes because we know as human beings? Or should we label it as unknown because it's not really clear and it's going to cause problems in our da data set? We can start experimenting with that and playing with that if we wanted to. How did they distinguish uh, Red Bull and Toro Rosso? Oh, great question. Yeah, so uh, actually, again, I've, I've, I've looked at this a little bit. Uh, I spent a little bit of time staring at these. If you look at these, I'll go back to, um, go back to our starting grids. Uh, it does an OK job at Toro Rosso versus uh, Red Bull. Um, you can actually see uh, the Toro Rosso uh, get, Red Bull get labeled here, and the lighter blue for Toro Rosso get labeled as well. It actually confuses Sauber and Toro Rosso because they're both kind of a light blue with a little bit of silver. So the intuitive thing that I would have guessed we would have gotten wrong, we didn't get wrong, but this other thing we did. So um, what actually I, I had to do, the reason why there's 244 frames, not 200, 
is I went through and I drew more boxes on Sauber and Toro Rosso to help give more data to the system. One of the things that's important for this kind of application is actually this idea of trying to build kind of a balanced data set. And that's, that's part of why we, we kind of talk about this. So uh, when I go through and start labeling my objects in it, um, I'll actually show you the one that produced our, our final trained result. Uh, you can actually see that we, we drew uh, only about 41 labels on Williams. So it didn't really have many samples of Williams. So I would just, as a developer, say I need more of this car. We got uh, not enough relative to uh, the other ones of Heineken or uh, other things like Toro Rosso. We only had 13 examples of that. So if I look at these, I'll actually show you what those all are. So if I select and label. These are all the frames that have Toro Rosso in them. And it tends to be uh, some specific examples. But uh, you can see this is actually labeled by the system here, the teal one. That's kind of, a, that's kind of about it. How many frames did you have to label in the frames? Uh, I labeled about 240, give or take. Out of 12,000? Out of 12,000, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So one of the things that's kind of cool, um, we, we actually use a technique called transfer learning. Uh, to, to help kind of pull down the training times. We bake into the tool, um, bake into the pipeline, uh, two uh, kind of pre-can models. Uh, again, for uh, image classification and object detection. If it's a uh, classification, it's a Google Net architecture. We've, we trained it. We generalized it on large data set. Uh, for object detection, which is this one, it's faster RCNN. Again, we generalized it. And um, by using transfer learning, uh, we're introducing it to the images that are my, my training data set. Um, one of the things, again, that we do to make this easy on folks is you'll notice that um, when I talk about training here, by default, I can just click go and not mess with anything. Like I can just, just kind of cruise through it. But if I choose to go in, I can start talking about what's the ratio of test to validation within the data set. So we take the training set, we actually uh, partition it. We default to an 80-20 split, but we use that to help mo measure the model's performance. And that's how we're actually making the little graphs that, that we actually show on the screen. And uh, like I said, internally, this is faster RCNN that you would know and love if you've played with any of the code from that. So that's, that's kind of uh, what I wanted to show you all. Um, Inside of the tools, we have other capabilities. And, and these are the, I talked about the base model stuff, uh, REST APIs. We expose everything over REST APIs. So again, the idea is to try to build an application that, that is accessible and visible to users um, that are building real code uh, and trying to deploy real code. We want to do it in a way that you can actually access and kind of uh, build out your app and not have to deal with the kind of guts of how do you get cafe where it needs to be? How do you make it do what you're supposed to do? And get a result to it. So we start talking about things more as composing web services that, at that point. Um, again, this idea of building a balanced data set is an important thing. So we actually have a technique called data augmentation, which directly helps with that. So I could go into my, my data set, and I could actually do things like apply random rotations to it, do flips, do mirrors, do different color uh, permutations. And we'll go off and we'll do copies of that data set. So I could actually say, uh, take my F1 data set, uh, give me uh, data augmentation of it, and build out like a 5x larger one to improve my training data to try to help generalize the model again. Uh, one of the cool things that's coming out actually real soon for us is we're actually adding the ability to bring your own custom model as well. So again, this idea of building a workflow, which is you know, curating your data, training a model, validating the model, and then deploying the model in production, you can apply that to almost any general machine learning, deep learning application. So we're actually going to open that up and enable you to bring your own TensorFlow model as well. So if you build a model in TensorFlow, it's your own custom architecture for whatever you're doing. You can still leverage um, the same label management workflow, the same auto labeling data augmentation stuff, and still be able to go off and talk again at that level of, of, of composing APIs and, and using the tools to actually go off and help you build um, that kind of thing. Another cool thing that's coming out that I think is interesting to folks that are hardware background, um, you can also try to take that same model and try to quantize it and, and build it in such a way that you can deploy it to hardware. So um, again, this idea of trying to leverage this out for production. 
in some cases, you want to do the inferences as close to the actual data source. So uh, again, the same idea of building a pipeline in a way that makes sense. We want to take that model to a certain step, validate it inside of the computer in the ser server with GPU, and then render the model effectively to an FPGA that's an embedded device that actually can uh, support that kind of uh, low memory footprint or high throughput that you might need. That's why we have the uh, YOLO model, for example, uh, inside our options, because uh, tiny YOLO v2 fits in a field programmable gate array, which we just announced with Xilinx like Tuesday. Uh, so you can go out and buy hardware and drop it in and do stuff with it. And uh, maybe we'll skip past that stuff. Uh, but really, overall, the, the application end-to-end -end fits into, again, this idea of building an end-to-end -end workflow. And, and again, the idea is, do you want to help move the user through that workflow and make it so that whether they're an image analyst or a subject matter expert in a given field like insurance or medical, uh, that they can do what they need to do and then go uh, hand off to a data scientist who wants to build that high-end model and then hand off to that DevOps engineer who wants to go deploy to production. And all those people need to be able to work in the same space, work with the same data, work with the same artifacts, but do different things with them. So that's, that's kind of my story. Y'all have questions? Sure. So it looks like on some of the uh, footage you have, the, yeah. the network's already labeled a number of items for you. So yep. in some cases, the driver, you know, which yep. driver is there. Are you able to leverage that data, the, the, the labeling that's been oh, yeah. for you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So that's, that's exactly what I was. Um, so as an example, right, um, the, when I showed the teal boxes versus the blue boxes, blue was me, teal was the system. Mm. So I actually went and I, I labeled. Uh, the reason why there was that 240 some odd frames is I labeled about, um, at first, I think like every 10th uh, frame in the video. So I got a certain number and got a, trained a model, got a result, it was okay. It actually was able to label cars, but it got the team names wrong more often than it got them right. So I went and fixed those up and then ran it again and it did way better, again, save for the Sauber uh, Toro Rosso thing. And then fixed up those two specific teams, ran it again, and then got to the point where I can show you the video. So you can see it got it wrong. Like I, I didn't correct the Mercedes rear view bias problem which I thought was, I, I left it in because it was a cute story, but uh, this is something that, that if you're not paying attention to managing your data sets and not paying attention to what you're really using as your source material, you can really introduce this into whatever the application is. So in the case of labeling a bunch of cars for an advertising demo, that's, that's one thing, but for other use cases that may be a much more interesting or much more problematic result that may occur from it. But yeah, we can totally leverage that when we start building up larger data sets. What was the resolution of the video image you were using? Uh, that was uh, great question. I don't know if it's 720p or 1080. I'm pretty sure it's 1080. Take a look. I think this is. What are you? Yeah, 1080. Um, one of the interesting things that we do um, again, it's just a an. A, uh, how uh, faster RCNN, which is what we're using internal for object detection, how it works. If you've not used that technique, uh, it has this idea of a native resolution for the network. So we actually uh, quantize the input image to uh, at worst or at best 1,000 pixels by 600 pixels. So if you show up with a 8 megapixel image, you're not going to get 8 megapixel. Meg it's not going to happen. There's trade-offs between performance and, and yeah. So if there aren't any other questions, I have more of a, a neophyte question. Sure. Um, when you talked about Tesla, are you, are you talking about the cars or some kind of, I thought I read there was some kind of compute block or something. Can you talk about the Tesla? Oh, yeah. So that's a great, that's a great question. So um, the, I mentioned uh, the GPU types here. So uh, in the system, uh, we actually uh, use NVIDIA uh, Tesla model P100s. That's just the brand name that they attach to it. Okay, um, yeah, no worries. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you extract any pictures from the videos, uh, so in your demo you said that 10 seconds. So you said that the video is It, it, 
totally depends. I mean, for, for me, um, so for us, uh, we actually have support for anywhere from one second to an arbitrary number. Mm -hmm. So it, it just depends on what the source material is. Uh, what I actually, I try to do is, um, if I'm doing a demo like this or trying to build something new just to see what happens, I'll try to go and get about 50 images, give or take. And you'll notice 50 images is not a very big data set. That is not a big data set if you've ever done anything with any quantity. That's because we can take that kind of pre-trained base model and use that as our starting point. So I can actually get a reasonable starting point from that and then start using the auto-labeling stuff to try to build a larger and larger data set. So I'll, I'll try to do like 50-ish and see how we're doing. Like uh, when I started this, I didn't know if I could tell all 10 teams apart or not. Like I said, just was, was your guess as good as mine? And it turns out it worked, so I did more and more to do that. When you talk about transfer learning, mm -hmm. what, what kind of model are you starting off with, and are you varying uh, the number of layers you uh, are yeah. training uh, as you go along? So um, we actually um, we use the same two fixed model architectures. So uh, for classification, it's GoogleNet. And so if you've um, looked, uh, read the papers, it's G-O-O-G-L-E-N. Anyway, uh, it looks like this. Uh, that one, GoogleNet with capital L, capital N. But we use GoogleNet as the actual network architecture. Um, we do vary the, the final, final layers uh, for the number of categories. So like for image, cla image classification, we will adjust that just because we, like if there's seven, uh, act seven outputs, seven categories, that kind of stuff. But the base architecture of the thing is the same. How many layers do you do? Do you adjust the number of layers you play with? No. So um, it's, it's uh, Google Net's what, like 15 layers, 14 layers? Sorry, 16. 16, sorry, my bad, 16 layers. Uh, but no, we don't, we don't mess with that. Um, we actually, again, like one of the things that's interesting here is we, we try to, to pick uh, a common denominator that gives you a useful result quickly. So we don't expose the architecture of the internals of the network. That's why we're, we're talking about the TensorFlow support and stuff like that. Um, <coughs> other, I saw, yeah. So uh, you said that you could load telemetry. Mm -hmm. How would that be done through the tool? Like what kind of telemetry? Yeah, so um, one of the things that, that we do is we, uh, everything's got a, a RESTful API. And um, today, the way that we expose that API is we, we basically take a JPEG, and the JPEG's the JPEG. But um, one of the things we're, we're entertaining here is adding support for arbitrary JSON that describes that. So I can actually, um, today in the schema for the system, I can describe attributes of, of the images, which are just arbitrary key value pairs. So if you give me something, I'll just store whatever it is. So if you have GPS data or if you have uh, the vehicle data or whatever, um, if we turn that on in the API, you can start storing that and exposing so it. So it's just through the REST API, not through the, uh, Correct. the web interface of Correct. Correct. Uh, the real honest reason for that is it's just we, we're trying to add features at a certain pace, and we're prioritizing other stuff ahead of that. Go for it. Is there um, anything you see, uh, I mean, I don't know exactly what use cases you are running into, but um, anything to gain by having the video processed with temporal awareness with, yep. with a memory network or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. It's actually one of the things we're working on um, right now. Um, so if I talk about uh, uh, the way we do reg object reco, in the system today, it, or classification today, it's discrete quantized frames, right? So frame one, frame two, frame three, there's no concept of continuity. So if I pick this up and put it down here, and I get a frame in the middle, you can't tell me which, whether it's going up or coming down, right? So this idea we're talking about is trying to add this idea of time series data to the, to the network. So I start talking about, um, uh, really this idea of action recognition or action detection uh, based on video snippets. And that's actually something that, that we're working on and um, IBM actually went and helped build out the uh, Moments in Time uh, data set, if you all haven't heard of that. Uh, let me show you what this looks like, it's really cool. Um, this is something that, that we're, we're going to bring into the tool at some point, but uh, uh, Moments in Time is a well-curated uh, Let's see. 
What do you want to see? How about driving? So Moments in Time is going to be very small little snippets uh, for a couple of seconds of whatever these, these categories are. And <laughs> that is technically possibly driving. <laughs> <laughs> Every single time I do this, I discover something new and interesting. But this is actually um, a, a, a different problem um, from what we've been talking about so far. Because it, the, the recognition of the action is actually something that must account for that entire uh, sequence of events, right? So given that um, the classic example I just told you, right? So if I put this down versus picking this up, playing them backwards uh, should give me two different results. So if I do this, I should get putting down object or whatever, or walking downstairs versus walking upstairs. So yeah, we, we, we do see there's a, a problem there. And, and one of the interesting things that comes out, to, that comes out of trying to solve that problem is um, you can kind of treat the, the data the same as a cl uh, classification um, data set. So for example, um, these are all uh, four or five second snippets of video. They're all categorized as a thing. So my workflow that I told you about where I'm categorizing or labeling data, same exact problem, same exact use case, same exact workflow, but the underlying model, network model architecture is totally different. We want to try to keep that same workflow in there for the user so they're not having to do anything new, but the same REST API uh, would be visible. So I could still throw, again, throw a stimulus at it, get a JSON response back. That's, that's kind of our fundamental idea here. We want to try to keep that to a common denominator. So as you build an application on the pipeline, you can keep, as things change in capability, you can keep up with it. And you can actually go do something interesting when we add a new feature or the industry moves and adds something new. Um, I actually really like, uh, so this is actually my favorite paper uh, that I want to share with you all. But uh, this is something that someone put out last year. And this is one year in computer vision. And uh, I like this because it lays out a really good treatment on many, 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 many topics. And um, it helps to kind of ground you and starts at uh, a kind of a high level of, here's, here's what we mean when we say classification. Here's what we mean when we say uh, localization or object detection or segmentation, things like that, right? So uh, it, it starts from there, but then it starts quoting and giving you a reference material, reference paper, uh, examples, and showing you exactly what, what's happening in the industry. So you can kind of see that uh, object detection as a whole, uh, we're talking about uh, RCNN, or faster RCNN type architectures, um, are, are really getting challenged by things like YOLO. So uh, again, we're adding support for YOLO, or we added support for YOLO into the system. Uh, if you've not heard of YOLO, uh, YOLO uh, stands for you only look once. So rather than scanning the image, uh, yeah, I know. So <laughs> rather than scanning the image uh, uh, a bunch of times and kind of zooming in a bounding box based on what I think and proposing a bounding box, YOLO looks at the whole image and then tells me what's there. And entertainingly, if you like YOLO as a name, the second version of YOLO was actually called YOLO 9000. Because, <laughs> because, yeah, no, it's, I, it's, it's really entertaining code. Like, I did not know that uh, YOLO, or that uh, GitHub supported, yeah, like, I didn't know that you can go look at, uh, if I go back to, there it is. I didn't know you could do this in git commits. <laughs> like, I just, I really didn't know you could do that. But like, every time I look at this, like, I'm just a little bit amused. Um, so are those just Unicode characters? Yeah, they are, yeah. yeah. Like, it, it, everybody respects it, and it does it. So there you go. Uh, but um, <laughs> the reason why I mentioned this paper is that this kind of shows you what's happening in the industry. And it shows you what's happening in research. And uh, it goes through and shows you what YOLO is capable of. Um, if I look at this video, uh, YOLO is doing the same kind of tracking I was showing you earlier. Uh, YOLO is only tracking 80 categories of objects based on MS Coco, or 85 categories of objects. So it will do things like umbrella, tie, person. It has no concept of the McLaren or Mercedes F1 cars, right? So this is where you start talking about how do you take the, the, the base thing that I have and leverage that for my custom application. This is where that transfer learning thing comes into play because this is where the generalized model has a sense of, because it's been trained on stuff, 
what stuff might be there. But specialization of that for the F1 example or for a retail example or other things is where you start getting more value out of the system. Because like, I kind of don't care that there's an umbrella there. What I want to know is where is James Bond in this video, right? And it can't tell me that. Um, again, uh, this, this is really nice because this starts telling you about what's happening in the industry in terms of things like uh, image segmentation, which is something where what's the direction we're going as well. Uh, segmentation, if you haven't heard of that, says that uh, given an image, not just don't just give me a bounding box back. Tell me pixel per pixel what's there. So tell me where the road surface is, or tell me where the pedestrian is, right? And we actually have a use case that, that we, we actually do, um, and you might have seen it on one of my things, but we actually have a, a crosswalk example where we have city crosswalk cameras, or city cameras at the corners. And uh, uh, there's a, um, uh, a question that comes up, which is, you know, how safe is this intersection, right? How do you measure that? You can obviously get stats for um, accidents and issues and things like that, but um, what if I were to ask you, <coughs> how often did something almost happen but never actually occur, right? How often was there a near miss between a pedestrian and a bike or a bike and a car? Where it worked out okay, but it was almost not okay. So we actually have uh, a demo we put together and, and a real proof of concept that's looking at traffic camera uh, video. And you can define a region of interest that says here's the crosswalk, right? So here's where the crosswalk is physically. And if I ever have a pedestrian in the crosswalk and a car in the crosswalk, something bad is happening here. It should only be one or the other, right? Like traffic law says it's either you or me. If it's both, something, is, something weird is going on. So I can start filtering my data set and looking for that and trying to understand, you know, why did that happen and trying to help the city fix that. So sure. um, since it's kind of dead, is that really true? <laughs> so let me tell you about scooters, man. <laughs> so, but that's that's really, but that's that's it's a thing, right? So, like, I, I mean, I say that um, the crosswalk. I say like, like I, I actually don't know the real law for that, but my intuition is that if if there's an event where there's both, this is this is a thing, right? This is something that we should look at, and I, and, and you can start answering questions that are more interesting questions like that. So you, know, you can kind of use this to, to get an idea of, of where the industry is going. And you can get a, an, a sense for what the capabilities of the models are. Oh, uh, have you guys ever seen this? Uh, check this out. So um, we're, we actually get this question kind of a lot, which is given that we can track cars and whatever, can I track people? Can I watch people move around in space? And it turns out, yeah, I can now, based on this paper. Uh, but what they're doing is they're actually doing human pose estimation based on a single camera. No lasers, no stereoscopic video, uh, no uh, extra funkiness with infrared. It is a single, um, basically, GoPro. And what they're doing is they're, they're estimating where everybody is, right? And again, I show this because this, this is something that I would not have guessed is possible two years ago, let alone last year. And this is something I can run at 10 or 12 frames a second now on a consumer GPU. And the way that this works is, again, it's doing that, uh, that um, uh, object uh, detection that we were talking about, right? So they actually define in the network uh, a basic human being as, if I click away from this, they define a human being as basically having a nose, ears, shoulders, uh, elbows, wrists, hip, knee, ankle. And that's, that's what it takes to be a human according to this model. So they, they actually go and they try to find uh, for uh, the videos, they, they search for those things and they try to localize those points on a person. And given that I can localize what the left knee should look like and I can localize what the right knee should look like and I can figure out that human beings normally only bend a certain way, then I can do an inverse kinematic model to figure out what the actual pose is. So it's the combination of that, that, that machine vision uh, capability, the, the computation of inverse kinematics, which is like, how do you make this, like if I show you 
that person, how does their leg bend to result in that shape to actually go off and, and derive that kind of stuff. So these are the kinds of things that, that are changing and kind of happening in the industry. And again, what we're, we're trying to do is we're trying to build that pipeline such that you can go and plug in stuff like this to it. So um, when we talk about uh, doing inferences in the tool or doing things with our data sets, you want to be able to go and label your data. You want to be able to take the output and do something with it. And we want to try to make it as, as friendly to developers as possible. So like what, building something on top of what we have here, I'd like to be able to say that, yeah, you, you can get your object and that's great. But that's not really the end goal here. Finding where the car in my F1 example was is not really, that's not going to solve my problem. It's really answering the advertising question or something like that. So I want you to be able to build code on top of that to go off and solve that. Other stuff? Cool. Okay. Uh, so thanks, Mike. That was a very amazing and exciting presentation. We'll be posting all this um, presentation and the paper and yeah, yeah. all the other material. And also, I think uh, Mike will be willing to follow up if you have any yeah, sure. question.